Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Thank you so much, Eliza, for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> I absolutely love the Starling Girl. I actually saw it at Sundance. So it was awesome to be able to see this again in preparation for this interview. And it was a gem of a movie, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jem has this immediate attraction to Owen, who is a married man. However, she finds solace in their friendship. Do you think that she sees a lot of herself in Owen? Which, um, like, what do you think generally attracts her to him? Or do you think this is just like an adventure for her? I, I think that he is an escape for her and she feels seen by Owen in a way that uh, she's never felt before with anyone else. He represents possibility um, and he shows her a new way of of having a relationship with God you know he tells her that God takes joy in anything that you love um, and he wants you to love and and be loved and so um, I think you know she sees they're both outsiders and she sees herself in him but he also um, gives her this new idea of a relationship with God, which uh, ultimately um, gets her into trouble. I really uh, noticed to Ren's uh, portrayal of Heidi and how Heidi's character bottles up her emotions. Do you think that Jem has learned those traits from her mother? Because it seems that Jem kind of does the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, you know, her church can be, can be quite judgmental. And, and we see that in the film, there's a, a scene where um, a kid is sent to um, a correction camp when he, he's uh, gone against the church and done something wrong. Um, and so there's a lot of, it engenders a lot of shame in the community. And uh Ren's character um Heidi she passes on that on to Jem and um passes on this uh you know this habit to sweep things under the rug when things go wrong or if there's anything that's uh you know happening in their private life that might raise some eyebrows they she turns a blind eye and that's you know when Jem begins to have a relationship with Owen, she buries it and pretends, well, she buries it and doesn't stop to consider the consequences because she's so wrapped up in her infatuation and it all comes crashing down. I find that sometimes with actors that to get to the core of a character, you really have to understand them and have some sort of you know, relatability to that character. So did you have any sympathy or even empathy for Jem as to what motivates her actions while you were portraying this role? I mean, absolutely. Like she doesn't have the experience to fully uh, understand the consequences of, of uh, you know, what she's doing. And she's never been um, looked at with desire before and that's a really intoxicating feeling when you feel that for the first time um and because this film is so subjective it's all through Jem's uh perspective it feels so immediate you know we're witnessing her desires her dreams you know her confusion and guilt all those things I felt it was so easy to connect with Jem and her experience and um that feeling of infatuation is can make you do crazy things, I think, when you're that age. Um, but she just reaps the, you know, she reaps extreme consequences because of the environment that she has been raised in. Um, but she's very relatable, I think. Indeed. Well, this was a beautiful film, beautiful performance, great job. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to Black Girl Nerds. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you as well. 
I have been telling all of the cast and the director, Laurel, that I saw this film at Sundance and I absolutely loved it. Oh, and seeing this a second time as I prepped for these interviews today, I just appreciated the film even more. Oh, so um, dear. Oh, good. <laughs> excellent performances, beautiful performances. And Owen is such an intriguing character. Uh, we even see a bit of foreshadowing in Owen's inability to remain loyal uh, mm -hmm. when he immediately breaks his Daniel fast <laughs> before it starts. Yeah. <laughs> is he a man that easily caves to temptation? And, and why do you think that is? Um, I, I think that he is not um, initially. Um, I think that he is an incredibly, he's incredibly devout. Um, he's just come back from this mission trip in Puerto Rico and has kind of had this epiphany um, about, you know, the expansion of what it, what it means to worship, right? And how, and how many ways that, that that can look and that his community where he comes from maybe isn't the only way. And he's found this kind of new alternative, maybe more taboo approach that feels like it it um, is more fulfilling. And and so I think when he comes home, it's he feels so rejected that his ideas are are squashed and are are uh, depleted by everyone. That I think that is what makes him act out in his. Uh, in, in his like unfaithfulness. I think that the fact that he feels so alone is what put and so cornered and alienated is what ends up making him feel like when he when he connects with Jem, like he that, that finally somebody sees him and finally somebody hears him for who he is and isn't judgmental and is excited about it. And um and uh so I think that that shifts something within him. And kind of digging deeper, you know, you said his connection with Jim, and my question is more in his connection with faith. The center of this film is about religion and also about rules. When you're taught and condemned to believe uh, what you desire is wrong, it becomes very toxic. And yeah. we see those situations unfold in this story. What does Owen believe he's done in his life that's wrong, that's made him turn to religion in this way? Hmm. But that's a great question. Like before we meet him? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think things that are incredibly human and, and pedestrian, right? Like desires and and sexual urges and um, doubts. And uh, I think these things that when they're not given a, a um, like a bleed valve can kind of inflate your spirit and eventually it'll pop some way. Um, and I think that is what we kind of witness uh, throughout Owen's arc. Um, and I think I think he's a, you know, he's a, he's a good brother and he's a good youth group leader and he um, wants to do right and he has good intentions, um, but there's been such a level of suppression that he doesn't have the vocabulary or the uh, experience to articulate or to handle or to how to, where to get help. Um, and, uh, and so that in expression turns into ugly acts, I think. I wanna ask the same question to you that I asked of Eliza, cause I feel like Owen and Jem are two sides of the same coin. Do you have sympathy or empathy for Owen and what motivates his actions throughout this story? Yeah, um, I do. I think obviously what he did is heinous and, um, and um, but I don't think it's unforgivable. I think that was the whole, my whole uh, kind of approach with him was I was like, if we make, if I go at this in a way where I think it's so unforgivable, then what, what am I saying about 
um, what am I saying in terms of like encouraging human growth? Because growth requires failure in order to learn. And so if you don't have the opportunity to fail and be accepted and understood by, for that and to forgive yourself, then you'll be stagnant in that place, frozen forever for the rest of your life. Um, and so I wanted to really try and make sure, you know, obviously as an actor, you try and empathize with your character as much as possible. And there's um, so much room for that within Laurel's script, right? She did not want it to be a black and white uh, telling of a toxic relationship. She wanted to make sure that there was a lot of ambiguity and a lot of places where people could leave the theater and be like, ah, oh, was that wrong was that messed up was that why did i want them to be together for some reason like um and by doing that by creating a relationship that is kind of familiar and not so instantly you can define that's toxic that's horrible if you do that then you're going to miss the signs of these relationships maybe around you with your friends or within yourself your own relationship that are maybe quieter and have less like bright red flags you know um, and so I think that was really smart the way the way that Laurel wanted to depict that. Like that. Absolutely. I completely agree. Well, thank you, Lewis, so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to talk to Black Girl Nerds. And thank this you. was thank a beautiful you. and incredible film. So appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for watching it twice. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. You too. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm good. How you doing? Good. I like good. your room. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Listen, Jimmy, I'm so excited to talk to you because out of all of the performances, which every performance was incredible, yours really stuck with me the most. It was extraordinary. Oh. It was beautiful. And it just resonated with me. And I saw this film during Sundance and oh, seeing it wonderful. again. Yeah, seeing it again the second time in preparation for this interview, it just, I appreciated it even more. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so Paul is a remarkably complex character. Here is a man of faith. He has to put on a face in public as this devout man of God. And then behind closed doors, he's this recovering addict that's relapsing and, and kind of falling to pieces. Um, as a performer, did it feel like you were playing two different roles? And how did you balance playing someone like Paul? Um, no, it didn't. It's it. It didn't feel like two different roles to play Paul at all because I could really relate to his experience. Um, and I think Laurel really saw what she was doing there because humans have this. You know, we're we are embodied chaos we are rudderless and um society has developed to kind of be like this is how we do it y'all and then there's little other sex whether it's a, you know a strict diet or whatever your belief religion whatever it is that we adhere to like and this is going to help me personally even more clearly um and strict strictly and um with with Paul, yeah, Laurel used this example of a of a depending on who you are, possibly extreme um, set of rules, and um, Paul found his life as a musician unfulfilling. I think we've all found large swaths of our life unfulfilling, and then it's it's time to make a change. And oftentimes we move in a direction that we've been encouraged by society or our friends and family. And like, this is the way to salvation. This is the way to, for clarity, for joy. And then we start kind of shaping ourselves to kind of be like, okay. And it, it starts, if it's not for you, it will start to wait on you and oppress you. And you keep bending to try to be the thing that this will work on. All the while, you're losing yourself. You're disappearing. And there's the, 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 the sweet human tragedy of the hope of that specific thing. If I go through and if I, if I give enough of myself away, I will be saved it is so universal in so many ways. And I actually had 
it wasn't religious based, but I had find my, found myself in that environment prior to filming this, and I went with it, and and it took so long to understand what I was doing to myself, mm -hmm. and so to get the opportunity to play the kind of turned up to eleven version of that, this pure and sad example that that Paul is is showing his daughter Jim. He's saying a very different thing. He's saying what he's been told, what other people have told him. And he's saying, it. he's like, this, just do this. It's so sad. He's like, and it, in his mind, he's like, it hasn't worked for me. Maybe I wasn't doing it right. And what she can see is, no, you should not be doing something like this. And that example of what not to do, I think, does help Jem find her clarity. Um, yeah. you know, and so it was just such a, such a pleasure to be given something so clear. And then the guidance by Laurel, I mean, the script, the, her, her on the day direction and adjustments, everything, everything was just a blessing. Um, and, and so important to me because there's a lot of entertainment out there and there's a lot of people are forgetting that humans created stories to help each other and to learn and to grow and expand and to understand themselves more um and this this movie just just knocks it out of the park i think oh yeah i agree completely and you bring up some really good points about how you describe paul because um we see paul he used to be in a band playing secular music and there's this great scene where he talks about singing about his sorrows and the struggles um about how he once got saved and he gave that up to god uh why do you think he's using god as an excuse for his own shortcomings and his willingness to give up so easily one that he once desired so so paul was meant to be a musician and he has the gift of of being a musician and with anything the trappings again it's it's humans musicians aren't inherently chaotic that what musicians are are tasked with a lot of stuff that gets them to be in touch with themselves a lot and that's hard to live in a life where you're constantly expressing all of your feelings and so historically yes musicians have leaned on booze or opium or sometimes things so that's where things get tricky and he couldn't really handle how to be emotionally open at all times and and not medicate like that and so he moved again like what i was saying society is to blame society is is what makes you question like uh especially with a lot of religions it's just like if you do it this way you're right it doesn't address the fact that he wanted to be a musician that he has an alcohol problem it's just rules and that's what humans do is they apply these rules instead of addressing the issue and god is great and god is good but you can't go there expecting that to solve your sadness you know right. Um, and so, but I don't think, I don't think he's blaming anyone. I think humans have a propensity to be told en masse, this will save you. Most people who move to, uh, who move to a d direct religion are looking for a chance to be saved because they haven't found it in themselves. And so, and a lot of times that works, but a lot of times you're asking for God to do something that you need to do yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. God is there to help. God is not there to, to unpack why it didn't work. And I think that's, it's that misappropriation that really leaves people feeling short. Like, well, why didn't this work? I have a friend that was eating meals that are, that are supposed to like up your mood and stuff. And he was eating the meal. He's like, I'm not any happier. I'm like, that's not how things work. Everything is is a like a multi pronged effort. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, it was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to Black Girl Nerds. And again, I just absolutely loved your performance. Brilliant work. Thank Starling you. Girl is such a beautiful piece of work, and I can't wait for everybody else to see it when it comes out.
It means so much to me. I'm so glad you said that. And thanks for talking to me. It was really fun. Thank you. Hi, Ren. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. I absolutely enjoyed Starling Girl. I saw this film at Sundance. So (laughs) it was a pleasure to watch it then. Yes. And um, seeing it for the second time in preparation for this interview just made me appreciate it even more. So I'm glad to be able to speak with you. And Heidi is such a compelling character. One of the things that I noticed about her is that she keeps so much of her anguish and her pain bottled up to the point where you get a sense that she's adapted to doing this for a very long time long time. Why do you think Heidi is so skillful at hiding her emotions? That is an amazing question. Um, You know, I think that in both in the community that um, the Starlings are a part of, their, their, um, their Christian church community and within the family, there's not a lot of benefit to sharing those emotions that, that Heidi sees. Um, you know, I think there's a degree to which like being upbeat or being protective about some of that stuff, um, you know, things that are bad or, um, like Heidi in in some ways I think doesn't want to engage because, it doesn't really feel like there's a benefit to engaging. And in some ways, I think she sees it as not engaging as a way of protecting um, her family from negative things. But I also think that within like a a church community, um, even though there's a lot of love, I think there can also be um, a lot of judgment. And Heidi is really someone who feels like there's safety in the rules, there's safety in the structure. And so she hews as close to that line as she can and doesn't really want to stray from it. So I think in some ways, like she sees things that do stray from that as being threatening. Um, So that's that's like an amazing question. Um, But also like, I want to add to that, like Heidi's focus is outward you know, her Mm -hmm. focus, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about um, before beginning filming is that like women in this uh, community see themselves as help meets. Like I'm here to serve my husband. I'm here to serve my family. I'm here to serve my husband. And by serving my husband, I'm serving God. And so Heidi's also like, it's not about me. It's not about my feelings. It's about serving my husband and God and serving my family. Um, and that is its own divine, um, job in a way. So, uh, you know, all of those things, I guess, kind of resonate, um, within me as far as why Heidi's kind of choosing to, um, not share a lot of what she might be feeling. Um, and at the end of the day too, she's just, she's a mom who's really struggling to keep her family together and keep food on the table and keep kind of like, keep like the, the family kind of moving forward, even as everything is falling apart. What an amazing question. I just think that is so amazing, Jamie. Like, oh my gosh. So good. Well, you know, she's, she's such an incredible character and we do see a lot of that serving projected outward because there's this incredible scene with Heidi where she asks Jim to court a local boy named Ben Taylor and it's here where we see this shift in the power dynamics between Heidi's relationship with her husband Paul. Is Heidi's control over the family decisions a way to protect Paul or her own reputation? I mean I certainly I certainly think like Heidi is very aware of reputation and definitely cares about that a lot. Um, That's such a big thing in a a Christian community. Um, And I I say that like from my own own experience, Um, I grew up in South Carolina and it was kind of like the first calling card about you was like one of the first questions you'd get asked is where do you go to church? 
so I definitely think that that's a component, but I also think to some degree, like Heidi's, like Paul's definitely like the, the like the lead, lead figure in the house, but really like Heidi's the person who's like calling most of the shots. And I think that doesn't just come from like who Heidi is kind of like um, fundamentally, but I also think that that comes from the fact that Heidi's really kind of like the, the engine behind joining um, this church. And also I think she's really like the, the person that kind of prides herself on, on protecting her family. You know, that was one of the, the ways in which I was looking at um, Heidi as a character in this story was she's a mom who sees the world through her own experiences, both good and bad. Um, and also is, you know, very fundamentally like trying to protect her children from having bad experiences. And, and one of the ways that she sees she's doing this is by being part of this community that feels very safe and very structured. Kind of like if you follow all these rules and we stay within this community, like everything's going to be fine for the rest of your life. And you're not going to have to go through some of the really difficult things that your father and I did. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, Ren, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to Black Girl Nerds. I enjoyed this movie the first time seeing it Sundance, enjoyed it even more the second time. Uh, Laurel, it's a pleasure meeting you and speaking with you today. Your film is so beautiful. I saw this film during Sundance. Oh, cool. And yeah, I loved it then and saw it again a second time in preparation for this interview and just appreciated it even more. Uh, so yeah. it's just an amazing film and I, I got so much out of it. My first question to you is, you know, the church that the Starlings attend is very strict and conservative. And this story takes place in a small Southern town. Have you found that through your research and crafting this story that Southern based or faith-based congregations cultivate this culture of being strict as opposed to other congregations like mega churches per se, that tend to be a little bit more progressive in their approach to faith? God, you know, I mean, it, it's really, it just depends on the church. Um, you know, it's not a, it's not a monolith. It, it, and that, that was something that I discovered so much in my research. Um, you know, th this church is an, is a non-denominational church. Um, and it, this it's modeled after a, a you know a lot of churches in my research and with my you know these kinds of churches that are are very insular and that you know if it if, if they're non-denominational that you know they're not answering to like a it's not like Lutheran or like answering to like a bigger uh congregation. Um they really can kind of be their own island and I, I've found that sometimes like that can foster even more abusive behavior. Mm -hmm. Um but you know, it's, it's, I, I can't say for certain that it, it's, it really just, it comes down to the church. It depends on the church. You know, the church that we shot in actually in Kentucky is a, you know, a small rural church um, with a female pastor and it's a Methodist church and, and they're lovely and super open-minded. And um, so, you know, everyone's different. Yeah, absolutely. The, the core theme of this film revolves around temptation, uh, from infidelity to addiction and recovery, and the faith-based based, uh, faith -based, rather backdrop makes it even more intense for these mm -hmm. characters. Why are these characters so stuck between what they desire and what they know is best for them? Uh it's it's the it's the world that that they are living in um you know with Jem, our main character she loves to to dance she she's in a in a in a worship dance troupe and she struggles because she's being you know she's learned that if she loves dance too much then it's if she's enjoying it too much, then it takes away from her devotion to God. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, it, it's, it's no focus on the individual. It's very much whatever you can do to be, to be thinking about God and your faith all the time. Um, and so she struggles to reconcile those two things, but then over the course of the film, she comes to sort of see that 
it can be both. She can love God and, and, and love her body and, and love dancing and, and, and the joy that she experiences it, it is honoring his creation. Um, and she's able to have her own relationship with God versus like what uh, her community tells her it should be. There's so many beautiful moments in this film and so many incredible scenes. Are there any scenes that still resonate with you, that still stick with you long after this project has been done and over? Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite scene to direct, it's sort of messed up to say, but is like the scene after, you know, without spoiling it too much, like, something happens between the two characters uh goes too far and then afterwards Jem's boundaries have been crossed but she can't communicate that her boundaries have been crossed and and uh Owen sort of like puts it on her and is like what's wrong like everything's fine and it's just like this it was this really fun scene to direct with both of them about power dynamics and and, and like who has the power and and um also manipulating figuring out how I want the audience to feel about the relationship like you know like being invested in the relationship at the top of the scene and then towards the end of it being like oh god wait why did I want that like it, it just took a, that took a lot of calibration and and delicate uh figuring out how to accomplish that and it was just really fun to do even though it was a very heavy scene um and so and when I watched that scene I'm they're, they're like sitting in the in a river and it's nighttime and and it's um that's my favorite I'm most proud of that scene I think yeah I know exactly what scene you're talking about and it was <laughs> done incredibly well thank you so much Laurel for taking the time to talk to black girl nerds what an incredible yeah, so <laughs> And um, I, I can't wait for everyone to see it when it comes out. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds.